Well, good morning, everybody. I'm a little late, but I'm here. This is Lowell White, your host of 360 Performance Talk on KUHSDenver.com. Good morning to everybody. We're going to talk about change and making sure that when you deal with change, you're prepared to transition and transform yourself because you might find out with this change, there's stuff that come to you, people and things that come to you that surprise you. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to showcase our discussion around some guests we've had on the show before. People like Curtis Granderson, Milwaukee Brewers, went to the National League Championship Series against the Dodgers. Or we're going to talk about Courtney Force, who just ended the NHRA season. And we're going to talk about Josh Cudley Bear Copeland, who's been on the show more than a few times, and he's on his way to New York City in about five and a half to six weeks um, to uh, compete for a million dollars. That's incredible. That is incredible. So as we have the, the music of Cornell Dupree in the background, can't get enough, like me, I can't get enough of the good things in Colorado. We're going to keep talking about making sure. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. And there we go. And it's wonderful. Can't get enough. I love it. See? Can't get enough. New knowledge, new efforts constantly. So we're here on the, the uh, 16th of November at 11.05 a.m. And we're talking about change. Um, and change in the, in the, in the competitive arena is a little different than change you might see um, in the corporate world because it doesn't go as fast. It's a little bit calmer, slower, if you will. So we're gonna we're gonna try to make some differences with that. But as I said, we're gonna talk about um, uh, Josh Copeland, uh, C.J. Granderson, Courtney Force. Uh, they are uh, people that have been on the show in the past, and they they are going through. Some changes, some things are going to be happening uh, to their uh, standards of behavior, their career path. Um, and as, as we typically do, we're going to start off with looking at the mindset. Of, uh, when you deal with change, uh, let me, let's take, for example, in the professional baseball arena. Now, baseball players um, have ended their seasons. The World Series is over. Congratulations, Boston Red Sox, for your your wonderful series against the L.A. Dodgers. Uh, I just had a conversation this morning with a neighborhood friend uh, who's a big Milwaukee Brewers fan. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, to, 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 to talk a little bit about his disappointment, the Brewers. He thought the Brewers would have been a great uh, play against the uh, Boston Red Sox. Um, and I didn't disagree with him. I thought the pitching of Milwaukee would have matched up differently and a bit more competitively than the L.A. Dodgers. Uh, pitchers did, especially mid-relief and closers, um, and that would presume in the baseball strategist mindset that um, the Brewers, if they got a, a run lead <clears throat> on the uh, Boston Red Sox, their pitching might uh, pull them through. Uh, that, that, that's my philosophy. That's my philosophy. Well, those changes um, didn't happen. Uh, the Red Sox uh, faced the LA Dodgers, so there's my first example of change. You've got an entire flip-flop of the uh, lineup for the Milwaukee Brewers for the 2019 season. Uh, many of the players are, are uh, moving on. They were free agents. Uh, they're going on someplace else. Some of them have already moved on. Uh, teams have picked them up. Um, and that being said, you have um, the organization itself dealing with change, but I'm going to talk about the individuals. So, for example, where where does a Curtis Granderson go after the season ends? Well, in the short term, he's going to go someplace warm. Off-season travel for baseball players it tends, to, tends to have them go to very warm places and, uh, and hang out. Now, depending whether you're a family person or you're single and you're playing the field, if you will, both figuratively and literally. Um, I know some baseball players I've worked with actually include in their offseason, they go to the Dominican. Uh, they go to South America. 
Venezuela and other and, and other parts of uh, warmer climates, and they play baseball. Uh, the baseball uh, competition in those areas of the world uh, is a great way to stay in shape uh, and to and to get another uh, maybe another edge to your game. Uh, I know a few uh, pitchers in particular, the hitters down in in uh, South America and the Dominican and Puerto Rico um, are just they're amazingly tenacious. Uh, I hesitate to say high quality, but they're they're not an easy out. They will challenge you. Uh, outside the rules and guidelines of professional baseball in the states, uh, because they can, and they and they're doing it because they love the game, and they want to make it up up here to the dance. Well, those are those are changes that you have to consciously envision, create a mindset. So whether it's Curtis Granderson or Josh Copeland uh, or Courtney Force. Their season's over, getting ready, tooling up. Um, I know that, that Courtney is busy with family. They tend to go to family, as do uh, the uh, the baseball players. I know uh, Curtis is going to be with family all this month on his food drive. Uh, uh, Grandy's kids uh, are feeding other kids across the country. Uh, so take a look at, at that if you can. Um, but at the same time, um, we think about family, it's a perfect time because we're dealing with the changes and the mindsets about the holiday. So <clears throat> whether you're a professional athlete or uh, an executive in the boardroom, uh, holiday seasons um, are there for everybody to participate in. So with the change of the professional athletes ending a season, they're facing these um, emotional swings, if you will. Um, I know with uh, some of the baseball players I, I deal with, they're going to be facing uh, being with a new organization. Now, they're going to probably have a few weeks, if not maybe a couple of months, of waiting time, a very limited contact with the new organization, the new team, uh, but that it's, it's going to come. So what do you do when you enter into a new arena? How do you, in the corporate world, we call it onboard someone? What's your mindset when you're faced with that, that kind of change? What do you... What are you working through? I'm going to give you three things to consider. Here's the first one. First of all, admit that change is a constant. You know, immerse yourself into that reality. You're surrounded by change. Every day you wake up, there's something's changing. You know, the temperature in the room, uh, the time of day you got up, that changed from the previous day. There's there's always these little little changes, big changes, all different levels of and degrees of change. So if we don't admit that to ourselves, that we're we're included. In change, it's difficult to move forward. Uh, so have that realization. Real, realize that change is a constant. It surrounds you. It's part of what you do. Um, and and by doing that, you're going to set yourself up for, for the second thing I'm ask you. The second thing is, imagine what the change looks like. So if it's a change that you go through every day, that thinking process doesn't take a lot of time. It, you're, you're very quick in your action. Here's an example, very simple example. Every day when you wake up, most of us think about brushing our teeth. Okay? I can envision that change from the edge of my bed to the bathroom, to the toothbrush, toothpaste, whatever you use, and brushing my teeth, or if it's electronic, or you know, do anything that, right? That's a change. Now, you might not have thought about that, because it's so commonplace. It's so much a part of your day. But that's what I'm talking about regarding that second point about dealing with change, is imagine what the change looks like. In order, it, to, in order to get better at handling change, you've got to have an image of what the change looks like. So, for example, let's expand the toothbrushing example and take a look at when you change, let's say you change the toothbrush or you change the toothpaste. Those are some things you might want to envision. You might want to envision, ah, you know, how does that feel? You know, I'm brushing my teeth. I'm, so you're, you're examining it in the moment as to what do you need to do with this new toothbrush to make sure you get to the right places. Now, as, I, as you expand your thinking around that simple example, on my second point about imagine what the change looks like, put it into your world of higher performance. 
and how do you move that image forward into more complicated, more sophisticated levels of change or more sophisticated levels of understanding and adaptation. So, for example, let's take um, Josh Copeland. He won the opportunity, and it literally he won it, to go to New York City and be in um, the gardens, uh, Madison Square Garden, and have the honor to fight in the finals of the PFL, Professional Fighters League, Championship rounds for heavyweights on December 31st. Now, at some point in the, in the near future, I'm going to give you the times and places for that fight, but Josh is going through that thinking about that. Now, that's a huge change because prior to this, Josh had never had this opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean he hasn't, isn't a quality fighter, didn't fight in quality events, but not at this level, not at, at this level of consequence in the in the win loss column and uh, what it means to him and his family and his career. So imagining what that change looks like is going to help you once you start taking the next steps. He's taking the next steps in his training. That's going to be different training. He's never trained for this level of fight before. Now, if you know Josh, not a lot's going to change. He's going to do the same things. He's going to be tactical. He's going to be strategic about his approach. But he still needs to remember to imagine what does that look like. Get an image in his head so that when challenged, when people and things come at him, he's got this image in his mind so his reaction time, his response to whatever is coming at him will be much more um, effective and efficient, basically quicker. He's a great counterpuncher, so I'll use that as an example. He'll counterpunch much more effectively. The third thing I want you to remember in these three things I'm sharing with you about mindset and, and adapting and adjusting to change is focus on what you can control in this process. As you might have seen uh, uh, behind my back was, uh, as, the, as it came through there was, um, Muhammad Ali, you know, that, uh, open facial expression about something he, he, he marveled at, you know. Uh, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee kind of mindset. Um, but he's an example as a professional where he focused on what he can control and did it really, really well. And in some cases, what he can control was eccentric and different and caused the other opponent to have to look at their image of change and what they needed to focus on to deliver the results of performance that were going to get them to the place that they would excel at. Um, and I, you know, as, as I'm saying that, I'm looking at my screen, I'm saying Donnell is out there. So good morning, Donnell Alexander down in good old Houston, Texas, uh, waving at you and saying good morning. But this applies to you. He's one example of that um, as a college ball player and now as a professional trainer uh, down in Houston, is you've got to focus on what you can control. It's not until you get that pretty much settled in your mind and you dealt with the changes that influence it, that you could move to the next level and, and understand what does the next level look like. Here's an example of that. Courtney Force is on the show. Uh, she is an NHRA, National Hot Rod Association, funny car driver for John Force Racing. Um, that's her dad, uh, John Force. And Courtney's been doing this for quite a while. She's married to a professional auto racer as well. Um, so she's She's in the, in the throes of it from February to November every season. And this year was no different. Uh, buying for the championship, seesawing back and forth, uh, constantly going through those, those changes. And one of the things I asked her about was her role as a drag racer, a professional drag racer with the experience and successes she's had at, but as a woman, as a female competitor. She very confidently, very quickly said to me in our interview that it doesn't matter. When I put the helmet on and the fire suit and I get it cinched into the, the cockpit of that car, I'm just like everybody else. And that's pure. That's pure. Quarter mile pure. Well, not quite quarter mile. A little short of quarter mile. But it's, it's a pure uh, experience. And the results speak for themselves. Doesn't matter. Female, male, doesn't matter. Short, tall, big, small. What well, doesn't matter? Your results speak for themselves. And that's huge. That's huge because she, that's an equalizer. 
So she she hasn't felt um, a lot of pushback as a female because her results speak for themselves. Well, for a lot of women, that in itself is a change. Envisioning that that change of of competing at any level, regardless of who is in the car next to you, it's it's your preparation. It's focusing on what you can control. You can control how you crank down the wrench. You can control what you see on the computer and adjust the uh, the timing and the pneumatics of the of the uh, ignition systems and the timing systems and, and clutches and you know every. And I'm, I'm I'm generalizing big time. So if any of my NHRA buddies are are listening, they know. Yeah, I'm f- I'm full of it. Yeah, I don't know the details, but I know enough to be dangerous out there. And, and and you know I'm right that there's so many different factors that if you have control of them and you've got the experience and the results of prior runs to add to your decision making, more likely than not you're going to consistently deliver a, a well-tuned car. And at some point, uh, seasoned uh, to, uh, uh, crew chiefs will say, "Stop tweaking. Stop. Just let it, just get it done. Put it in there. Let it go and let it go, because there's other things that affect." Um, what happens on the track that you don't control. So <clears throat> one of the strategies I want to offer, I'll summarize those three things real quick in the mindset thing. Uh, the first one was admit the change is constant. It's there. It's not going to go away. Uh, it's part of what you do. Um, the second thing is that you you want to focus on what, what you can control for you um, and that imagine what the change looks like. So let me, let me come back here a minute. First thing is, admit that change exists. It's a constant. Second thing is, imagine what change looks like for you. When you're in the midst of that change, you know that some of that change, you've been there before. My toothbrush example. And if you want to get better at brushing your teeth, imagine that. Think through it. You've got a basis, a foundation of understanding. So the third thing is, is focus on what you can control. Um, so that you can have success at the highest level. Um, and, and that when you, when you imagine these things, you know what details you need to focus on. Now, with that, the strategy then comes out of there being that when you, when you have these experiences of managing the change, visualizing the change, focusing on what you can control, you can share that with people and things that you might need to use as resources to support you. So, it, cause it's, you know, in the business world, I tell executives, your staff cannot read your mind. Share with them your expectations so that they know when and how to be accountable. And that's the big part of the strategy I'm sharing with you here in the mindset segment, is that if you focus on the details around the change and then share those understandings, those realizations with your uh, people that you trust, you can create plans that have actions related to them that really are impactful, uh, that really drive what is desired by you first. You know, have you ever been part of something that somebody asks you to do something and you go, well, I don't know how to do that. Now, you may have even shared, I don't know how to do that. But you didn't get any insights or training to adapt and adjust to it. So that change didn't include as I've, as I've asked you to consider, what does it look like? I've never been there before. I don't know what it looks like. I don't have any experience. Didn't get any training. So it's very hard to focus on what I can control because right now I feel pretty out of control. So when you're setting up a mindset going through change like my uh, previous guests have gone through um, and, are, and are going through, Josh Colton, for example, is one of those. He's He's going to go into the next level of change with this uh, event on December 31st. Um, and he's going, to re- he's going to need to call on some skills, the skills that I talk about, those mental focusing skills that help you bring your mindset to the table uh, with the strategy that we're talking about. Now, before I get into the skills side of things, I want to uh, thank my, my colleagues here at KUHSDenver.com uh, for all their support. Uh, and we have to remember that... You know, Andrew, we start talking. <laughs> we got to watch the clock. I, that's my bad, man. You got me, got me thinking about a subject that uh, is, you know, it's it's amazing how constant and how how impactful history is on our future. 
um, I, I'll pay, I'm paraphrasing this, but uh, in this small moment of taking a break and I'm looking at the label on oh, Empower, the Empower uh, lotion and uh, oils that we have here, I'm empowered by the fact that, man, if we don't deal with change in a substantive way and focus on what we can control, it's going to overwhelm us again. Um, and Henry and I were talking about some of what history has, has shown us, and we're still not ad adapting and adjusting in ways that are um, safe and comfortable for our, our communities. So, that being said, Empower. Empower Oil, uh, it's, it's like the label said, put it on where it hurts. It's a body care product. Um, I encourage you to go to their website um, and check it out. It's empowerbodycare.com. And when you do that, it's CBD, so you can... It can be sent to you via mail. This is awesome material for those aches and pains from when you are a competitor. Uh, doing your biking, your snowboard. I've got a new snowboard. I'm excited about that. I'm sure I'm going to have some bumps and bruises. Uh, pushing my limits a little bit with that. But I would use Empower. They've got bath salts, lotions, and the oil uh, for that. I love this oil applicator because of the, the ball, the roller ball applicator. It's wonderful stuff. But make sure you get benefit of this discount coupon from me to you. It's LW010. LW010. Uh, take a, take a look at the Empower products. Uh, the lotion and the bath salts are, are awesome. Um, now, that being said, let's, uh, let's move on with our, our next segment on skills. Uh, when you're listening to 360 Performance Talk on KUHSDenver.com. Love my Fridays. Love my Fridays at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So join us here where we talk about performance issues. We, we relate it to um, competitive sports, but know that my focus is not just on competitive sports. It's also on elite executive uh, acts of excellence. And, and using the theories of sports performance theory and psychology, um, which uh, take in, in mind that the speed at which uh, sports performance works is a little different uh, speed, a little faster, uh, but definitely direct applications to the business world. So in the skills segment, that that's a bit of a camouflage. The skills I'm talking about in this particular area are related to um, keeping the brain active and responsive as quickly and as productively as possible. So sk here's examples of skills. Uh, your communication techniques or skills. Uh, your um, breathing, breathing setup is, is a skill you want to have. Uh, your organization and planning skills, time management, uh, your ability to um, get yourself focused in quickly without hesitation, especially if you're adjusting to uh, actions that didn't go quite so well. Uh, error, failure, how do you respond, get back from that. In the sports world, um, I didn't make the block. My team gave, my, my teammate got tackled. What am I going to do? How am I going to quickly think about that and adjust quickly? Well, what do I do to do that? <sighs> Big breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. Clear yourself. Get centered. And as you're doing those breaths, you're thinking about, you're reflecting on the strategy I gave you a minute ago in handling change. What do I control? I'm breathing. I've got a vision of that. So you use those techniques as skills to get your mindset focused in on where you want to take it and how you want it to benefit you. That's what we do. So that's the skill side of things. So I'm handling change. I just got word that I'm on a new team. What do I do? <sighs> take a breath. Maybe I'm excited. Love to go to that team. Been waiting for that for years. Well, that's wonderful. Good morning, Paul. Uh, but maybe it's a team you don't want to be on, but you're a pro. And they're paying the freight. They paid the contract. Because at certain levels, like at C.J. Granderson's level or Yelnick or whomever the player might be, Heard at Milwaukee Brewers, you know, any, any number of players that are, that are staying where they're at or are transitioning uh, to another team, they already have an economic standard set. Their salaries, their contracts are pretty set. So they know they got the money. But at the same time, if you, you're adjusting yourself to handle that change with using the, the skills, meditation skills, breathing skills, maybe it's your routine to time 
uh, and routine and commitment to time management where you stay on your schedule. You don't adjust it. You don't let the emotions of the team you don't want to be with, but they just bought your contract, get in the way of you being your best. So let me make the connection again. Mindset is driven and pushed by the skills you apply. So when I, I, I mentioned to you, there's, there's three components of handling change that I want you to remember. One is admit that it happens. Don't ignore it. Don't turn your back to it. It's, it happens. Because if you don't do that, you're not, you're going to have a difficult time imagining what the change looks like so that you can get a vision in your head and then be able to apply your focus on those actions and people and things that you can control so that that builds and brings you to delivering your best. And it's the skill set on those three factors that you need to apply so that you're always ready and prepared to deliver your skills. Okay? Hey, thanks for everybody showing up today on Facebook. I really appreciate Facebook Live. Um, sending my waves out there. Uh, uh, Miss Ford, good morning to you. Glad to have you with me. Um, but we're talking about skills that are, the word skills I use is different than what you might, you know, we're not talking about the skill of driving a car, you know, not that, not that specific. These are more the intangibles, what in the sports world we call intangibles, you know, that ability to focus in a moment, the ability to be resilient, mental toughness. Those are categorical descriptions of skills, the intangibles. But it's in that skill area that you're able to bring your mindset to a place where you can deliver an execution on that. And that that's important. Uh, at the same time, it's important with the things we're talking about right now, especially in the holiday season. Uh, you know, those of us who have difficulty um, recognizing the changes around us and then making those adjustments to um, create an image of how to handle the change and then focusing on our control, that can be kind of frustrating sometimes. And the primary reason it can be frustrating is because it uh, comes with uncertainty. Uh, it comes with emotion. Uh, it comes with um, frustration. Because one of the things is, th it's new <laughs> in many cases. It's something you haven't experienced before. It's a new team, a new environment. Yeah, you may know their name, may even know people that have been on that team before, but now your contract was purchased by somebody an organization, and you don't know what the obstacles are. You may be able to guess and anticipate fairly accurately because it may not be the first time you've done this. For example, with Curtis for Anderson, he was with four teams in the last two seasons. Four different opportunities to make changes. Now, he, he's, he's been traded before that, but just imagine the circumstances, the context that he's got to put in his mind and envision. He was with the team from the beginning of the season to past midpoint, and then at those moments where you can trade the, you know, go out and get free agents and pull, pick up their contracts to improve and incur and build your roster for postseason time. That's what happened to Curtis because he knows who he is. He is a seasoned veteran with leadership skills that have proven to deliver not only results on the field between the lines. In getting hit, making it out, but he's also a force of leadership and guidance in the dugout because of his experience. So when you have a clear understanding of that as an individual, you go forward taking action on those uh, people and things that um, you're confident with. And it's that confidence that creates the impression of you being a leader. Uh, every time I talk about leadership, I think about... Um, Charles Barkley, and, um, and, and back in, in his early years of his career, he's since you know, kind of thought through it and adjusted a little bit over the years, but he said, I, I'm not a leader, but it's their choice if they want to follow me or not. I, don't, don't put that label on me. Now, he has since wrapped his arms around that and realized that it's, the true leader doesn't ask for people to follow them. The true leader does what they need to do to adapt and adjust to change wrap their arms around the images that change creates for them, and then takes action on those images on the areas of people and things they can control. That's why Charles Barkley became uh, a focus 
of his leadership because he was a leader. He didn't realize it at the time. Now I think he does. He's an example of an example. <laughs> That's redundant. He's a great example of um, of being a leader and uh, being in charge. Charles in charge. I think there's a show about that. <laughs> uh, that says how old I am. So uh, let me take a bit of a, a breather here and talk to you a little bit about, uh, before we get into the mental conditioning segment of our show, we're going to talk a little bit about week 11 in the NFL. Um, one of those uh, events in week 11 has already taken place uh, with Thursday night football. Uh, but I also want to take you back to week 10 last Sunday um, when um, Kansas City and the Rams played. Um, that, that was a great game. Uh, 9-1, and 9-1 one, um, going after each other. Um, but it's the individuals in those games that really make me a bit impre- I'm impressed with. Uh, Pat Mahomes, uh, Texas Tech grad. Um, you know, he, he's, he's, he's been influenced and guided by some really great minds of the game, of his position as a quarterback. But even more importantly, Kirk, um, uh, down there, his head coach at Texas Tech, um, he's, he's a good judge of, of character and people and ad- adjust and adapt to the changes those young people bring to him. And I'll tell you what, I've, I watched Patrick Mahomes as, a, as an athlete at Texas Tech before he got the, head, the starting position as quarterback um, and how he worked with his head coach, uh, who was a quarterback at Texas Tech, went into the NFL, uh, was a Heisman Trophy candidate uh, during his time. So he, he produced. He had a pretty good vision of his plan and how change was going to impact him. Um, so Patrick Mahomes is a young man who not only watched the rest of the season, but to watch the rest of his career. He, he is going, if he's not already, the heir apparent to, uh, to, uh, Tom Brady, uh, and, uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, uh, Andrew Luck. I mean, on and on and on, you know, and, and these guys are still in the league. I mean, Andrew Luck and Pat Ryan, um, are having phenomenal seasons. Um, uh, you know, Andrew Luck's a comeback. Matt Ryan is, is, Continuing to perform, uh, then you have, uh, yeah. here, I'm going to pause it for a minute because I'm getting too excited. The NFL this year, in my opinion, is a season of QBs. Um, and yes, they're, they're overseeing some teams that have great dynamics that, that see the changes coming, anticipate changes. I'm only hoping that they, they, uh, produce, uh, use the strategies I've given today about how to handle change. But, Here's an example for us to watch on this, this comment I'm making about quarterbacks. It's the season of quarterbacks for the NFL. Well, here's, here's one coming into town. Mr. Rivers is coming into town. Uh, Phil Rivers, Los Angeles Chargers are playing, uh, the Broncos on Sunday. And I, I, you know, I don't want to wish ill against the Broncos, but I tell you what, Phil Rogers has more than his fair share of images to take into, into consideration for uh, his performance, anticipating his performance for Sunday. Uh, I don't know how, how when it was the last time they won in um, in our stadium. We don't have a name yet, do we? I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> so Phil, Phil's got, um, if Phil follows what I've been saying to you guys today about uh, adapting and adjusting to change, he'll, he'll think about, yeah, change is a constant, and I've changed. I'm still Phil Rivers, and I've learned a lot of things. But he also knows, if he's thinking about change, the defensive backs for the Broncos have changed. The defensive linebackers haven't changed much. They're still tenacious. They're going to still come after him because Vaughn Miller loves to chatter to Mr. Rivers and get him a little excited. So there may be a change that Phil has to deal with, is is managing his mindset. Excuse me. Uh, for that, for the game on Sunday. Um, so as, as I segue into the mental conditioning uh, segment of our show, I'm using Phil Rivers as an example of it because the environment in Broncos, in our stadium, I'm going to call it Broncos Stadium because there is no name. There. I hope they may even call it Broncos Stadium, probably not. <clears throat> uh, but he, he's got, he's got something to prove. Um, and I think handling 
his emotions, managing his emotions in an environment. An environment has a lot of impact on your preparation in dealing with change and imagining what you're going to do with that change and then staying really focused on what you can control by using, you know, the strategy I shared with you a minute ago is see the details. I tell every one of my players, especially football players, when you go into an arena, you've been there before, you've seen it before, but look for what has changed. Look for the details. Focus on the details. Maybe there's a color that's different. Maybe there's something in your line of sight as you walk up and down the field that you need to be att pay attention to because it may be a distraction. If you don't see it right away, it might be something that would surprise you and be unexpected. So pay attention to those details. And then go, in, in Rivers' case, go to your receivers and talk about this with, with, your, with your players because these are people you trust to catch the ball. And as if you've watched Phil Rivers at all, when he gets flushed out of the pocket, <clears throat> he's very creative. <laughs> so his receivers, I'm sure, have to uh, imagine what change looks like for them as well, um, given any situation where uh, Phil has been flushed out of the pocket. Uh, but he's going to have a plan. She'll share that plan with your player so that in that environment, you're able to uh, take action in a way that delivers results that are somewhere, somewhere close to what you expect. So that's what the mental conditioning part is. is it's, it's looking at the environment, but reflecting back on your mindset and the skills you, you apply to bring that mindset forward into this space. So, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, you know the family component. You know, Josh Copeland, big family guy. Uh, Courtney Force, big family guy. Curtis Granderson um, is a big family guy. Lansing, Illinois. Um, and TF South High School, all that community down there, um, and his uh, connections with UIC. Off-season, Curtis is involved with all those things, as are all of the athletes I've mentioned. Well, that being said, when you change the environment, there's going to be there's going to be changes with uh, the off in the off-season uh, for uh, Curtis and for Josh going into New York City. Uh, I asked Josh, and the last time we were here, I said. Are you going to take the, your son and your wife with you to uh, the, sh the show in, in uh, Madison Square Garden? He said, you know, it's, it's, it just it doesn't fit. It's not something. So he considers his environment. And look, at he loves his son. He loves his wife and the family he's created. But that, that's not a good fit uh, for him to be able to apply the skills he needs to. My, my set of definition of skills as well as his skill of uh, being a fighter. Um, in the arena. So he's, he knows what's, what's the right way for him to address the change for him as it relates to environment. Um, with, with Courtney Force and, and Curtis, it's just environments. It's just getting to a place to relax, enjoy, have fun with yourself and, and prepare for the off season. With Curtis, he's looking at preparing to go to another team. Or maybe he's looking to prepare to not go to another team, baseball team. Maybe it's a different kind of team. It's not a baseball team. It's not a franchise. Or maybe it is a franchise, but he's not going to be on the field. He's going to be at a different level of participation with the franchise that doesn't mean he puts on a uniform or wear cleats. Or maybe it's a broadcast movie. Who knows? Those are visions of change that he will be thinking about. I know he's probably thinking about it routinely. Um, and then focus on what he can control so that he can deliver through some strategic thinking and sharing with people he trusts, create a plan for him that he can take action on comfortably and with confidence to move forward. So with that being said, we're getting close to our last our last segment. But that that's mental conditioning. That's the environment. When, talk, when I talk about mental conditioning, it's consideration for your environment and and how do I bring my mindset and my skills into that environment, and so that I'm ready to adapt and adjust to the changes I wasn't anticipating that I didn't see coming. I don't know that anybody's really prepared for change, but we're human beings and we're there's, there's the entropy of life, and that in itself has changed. I, and I think I've mentioned this before, but one of my 
my mentors uh, and colleagues is Deepak Chopra. And Deepak, as a, as a physician, you know, board certified physician, um, realizes that our body fights against entropy and the negative forces of the universe and is constantly trying to regenerate itself. So every seven years or so, our entire cellular structure is recreated. Now, there's change that impacts that evolution of things, that development of the cellular changes that go on in the body. But that's a reality. It's a scientific proven reality. The quality of that change, of the cells regenerating themselves, is up to us. How we, what we eat, when we eat it, uh, in what environments we eat it in, the activity, the physical activity, to, to use those calories, that energy from the food, is all part of the environment that we create around ourselves. The quality of that environment has a direct impact on not only what you can control, but the delivery of your actions, the quality of that delivery in that space. So then we come to our last segment of the show, which, which, is, which is performance results. We talk about performance results. Now, I'm not talking about a, ri a, a ribbon or a trophy or a, a bonus check or uh, a new office because you, you achieved great results. So they're going to give you the corner office. Uh, I, I, I've been generating revenue for years, and now they're going to honor me with a partnership agreement. I mean, I'm giving you examples of what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about those tangible end results of process. I'm actually talking about process. Performance results, because we're here at 360 Performance Talk on KUHSDenver.com. That's what performance results segment's about. It's about the process. What methods and strategies do you do you use, do you create to process your performance to get you to possibly the score is in your favor at the end of the game? Doesn't necessarily mean that's what we're looking for, because I I've been part of, I've coached and played on teams that we delivered the best effort. We processed through and delivered performance results, but it didn't reflect it on the scoreboard. And we honored our competitor. We said, hey, great job. Awesome. Loved it. Loved it. But it didn't come out in our way. We didn't get the trophy we wanted, the reward, the bonus check, whatever we, we were looking for. Um, it's process-oriented. That's how we also, by looking at process in the performance results area, identify areas of improvement and developing our skills. That's why process is so important as a focus. It's not about the trophy at the end, because those of us who look at the trophy are the ones that are going to be easily taken down. In professional fighting, I'll come back to uh, Josh Copeland. Josh Cuddly Bear Copeland. And share with you what he has shared with us on, on 360 Performance Talk in the past. He's a strategist. He's a tactician. He knows what he does well, and he hones that. But then he adds to it. In the fight that he knocked out the contender uh, in the semifinals. That wasn't an accident. You've seen some fighters come through with a big haymaker and they get lucky and they land the punch and knocks the guy out and they were unexpected. It was unexpected they were going to win. That's not the case with Josh. Now, some can make an argument that that is the case with Josh because of his prior fights to that. He was a number eight guy to get in. He got in by the skin of his teeth because somebody else didn't, didn't make their points and, and allowed Josh to get in. All right, got it. And you can make an argument, but if you break down where Josh was at in that fight and his movement, in particular, the slow motion is the prelude to him throwing that punch, you will see Josh calculating his footwork, his body position, what he had trained to do. He added better mechanics to his stances when he was uh, practicing that aided him in getting that, that punch, that knockout punch set up to take advantage of that fighter. And that's that's what you see. It's proven right then and there. But it couldn't have happened if Josh didn't first admit that change is, is always there. It's a constant. That I know what change looks like for me. I know what I need to do. I've added this deeper stance, get in a stance, really get my, my lower body into my punches. It's not just upper body swings. I'm, I'm really focused on that. He practiced that. He made an image of that. And he got control of it. 
He focused on what he could control. And then strategically, in that practicing process, he was making a plan. He's watching the other fighter so that he would be ready to take action. And the film don't lie, people, because he took action. And guess what? There comes the knockout punch. And he's on his way to New York City in Madison Square Garden on December 31st to fight in the heavyweight championship round for the Professional Fighters League uh, series. Million dollars. One million dollars. Outstanding. 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 Now, that example is very similar to if you were, if you're watching us, you saw a, a, a slide go by of the LA Dodgers last season when they came in. That last season they, they won the National League Championship and they went on again to the World Series. They faced the Houston um, uh, team um, and they didn't get the World Series again this year. So I would just ask, and I'm hoping some LA Dodgers are listening. Um, or baseball fans that can connect to the LA Dodgers. What image of change do you have from one season World Series to the next season World Series that you're going to take with you into 2019? Because I don't know that a lot of things are going to change on the roster for the LA Dodgers. Uh, and if it does, it, it's going to be just building up like the, the relief pitching area, maybe some uh, impact hitters that are skill position players, because they've got some talented young people. Uh, Chris Taylor is one of them. Uh, Chris Taylor is like the utility man on the field. Uh, put him in the outfield, put him on the infield, and the kid's making plays. And, and not just defensively, he makes plays at the plate as well because they move him from uh, number one in the lineup because he can get on base, he's got a high base percentage, and he, he's, he's got a pair of legs as well. He can run the bases. Uh, but they also put him down at number seven as, as the, you know, bottom third, move us across the ninth batter up into the top of the, the lineup kind of hitter. Lots of great strategies. So I'm hoping the LA Dodgers are looking at and listening to me when they, when they examine the film and they look at the performance and they ask themselves, will we really focus on what we can control? Did we make plans with that in mind and took action accordingly? Um, I really like the, the management of the LA Dodgers. They, uh, they impress me. They're, they're one of many, but, um, the other Dodgers management is, uh, in the dugout is one of the best, and they make some really great calls. All right, that being said, we've got about uh, 10 minutes before the top of the hour at noon. Let me remind you, you're listening to KUHSDenver.com. I'm your host, Lowell Whiteman, of 360 Performance Talk. You're seeing a montage of images behind me. If you're watching us online uh, at the KUHSDenver.com website, um, or if you're checking us out on Ustream or or Facebook Live, you see it running behind me, and those images uh, are legit and representative of the kinds of circumstances that uh, athletes uh, at the high level uh, have to face uh, with regard to looking at change and facing change. Um, we're talking about the impact of change and the reality that it's a constant. It's all. It's here all the time, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share some. Uh, some, some thoughts and some, they're based on some true life stories with regard to, uh, drag racing. Um, and Courtney Force, I mean, I, I can't say enough about her, uh, in particular, but also her family and the traditions and the stories that their history has, has, uh, been a part of, uh, in the National Hot Rod, uh, Racing Association, uh, um, trophy cases and halls. Uh, Courtney and her sister, um, have brought a, a great quality of racing to the table. And more importantly, they, they brought the, the, the message that, look at National Hot Rod Racing Association had to face the fact that women were in the, in the business. And they've been in the business for, since Muldowney. Um, and back then, I can only imagine the story she has to tell and has told about that struggle. But they're there. They're here. Now, you got, what are you going to do to make it better? What do you control to make it better? So pushing it to the next level. Um, is it is it work with the young girls as Courtney does in sharing her story, wrapping her literally wrapping her arms around those young ladies and saying, You can do this too. Junior dragsters, get in it, be part of it. Um, have your mom and dad, hopefully both, encourage you and be part of your crew uh, to move you forward. 
Um, but it's those performance results, those processes we set up for the young girls, for the young athletes in general, not just young girls. Um, I have to compliment on air here the um, Niwot High School women's volleyball team. They took second in state uh, behind Lewis Palmer. Uh, a great, great uh, tournament for them um, in the semifinal rounds against Longmont, a team they had faced twice prior in the season, had split with them. Um, they are uh, Niwa High School Cougars. Uh, Lady Volleyball team is legit conference champions, as well as being uh, number two in the state behind Lewis Palmer. But they went through changes where they had to understand process. They had to understand what are the performance results in small pieces. As me as a person, handling my image at school and, and yet staying focused on what I can control. Now they signed their letters of intent to go on to college. There are four seniors of the six that graduated that are going on to Division I programs. Two are going to the School of Mines. Um, so be aware, uh, if you're a, a fan of volleyball, watch the School of Mines um, participate and and. Um, and excel with two Niwa High School Cougars. Well, those young ladies are going to be, they're no longer seniors. They're freshmen. They're not champions anymore. They got to prove themselves over again as freshmen on the team. Well, I know that the, the ladies, uh, uh, Madison, Audrey, Zoe, and Emma will prove themselves worthy at their high, at their colleges when they go there. Uh, Wake Forest and Central Virginia. Um, or the, Emma's going to Central Virginia, is always going to Wake Forest, and Madison and Audrey are going to School of Mines. I know them well enough that um, they will wrap their arms around change and excel um, at, at the schools they're at. And if the coaches are watching on how these young women manage change and process their work ethic through to results that make sense to them, they'll be putting them in the starting lineup sooner than later. So, we've been talking about change today. And trans translating your understanding into things you can control. That because you can control these at your actions in areas of skill that you have, that are not my definition of skill, I mean skill of, you know, running, hitting, catching, jumping, all those kinds of skills. The physical nature of the game that your brain connects to, to deliver through your understanding of what change is in front of you. So that when you create that image and, and change approaches you unexpectedly, I didn't expect that. But because you're able to, you've been practicing how to go through the change, you understand how to adjust and adapt. That's called resiliency. And if you do that often enough with, with out hesitation, you become mentally tough. The more you step into an arena that you're not familiar with and practice the skill sets I've asked you to practice, along with the preparation of your mindset, that yes, change happens every day. It's a constant. And I am taking charge of what change looks like for me. I'm creating an image in my mind about what change looks like for me. I then have a focus on what I control and it can apply my physical skills. This is an example of what I do. Every single day, connect the brain to the body to take action in a purposeful way that's mindful of what I know and what I can control. That's all I need to do, bud. The results speak for themselves. And it's after that experience that you've delivered results that you adapt and adjust again for the shortfalls and the failures. Success is easy. Self-explanatory. Score on the scoreboard says it all. But what really gets me jazzed is the process. What, what it takes to get me, get my mindset into a place that I'm applying my skills in an environment, that mental condition, so I can then process to the performance results that I desire and I prescribe. Man, I'm so excited. It's going to be a great, great football season. I think it's a quarterback season for the NFL, Major League Baseball. Uh, they've already started to make changes, uh, adapting and adjusting to the lineups, the free agency, the players. Uh, they're looking at what went on, and they're gonna they're gonna make the, the changes. That then creates changes for the players themselves, and they're gonna wrap their arms, literally and figuratively, around their families 
both fam blood family as well as her baseball family. Um, we've got uh, NBA basketball, college basketball. Soon, before we know it, March Madness will be upon us um, after the first of the year. But now we're in the beginning of the holidays. Next week is Thanksgiving. I hope everybody has a great and wonderful Thanksgiving. You'll, I'll be here Black Friday broadcasting at KUHSDenver.com, uh, 360 Performance Talk, about mindset and creating a mindset that drives you to the areas of, of performance excellence that you expect for yourself. So, as I say that, let me just uh, say good uh, good day to everybody and have a wonderful, wonderful uh, um, rest of the day and weekend. I'm going to say goodbye to my Facebook friends out there and enjoy the day. This is Lowell Whiteman with 360 Performance Talk saying good day. So, we're still online with uh, with our uh, our friends out there in the international world. Uh, we're going to... Say goodbye to them, stop our recording, and tell everybody about what we're doing here. So have a great day. Here's Kevon Campbell. Tell me what you want to do. <laughs>